that these things are real and more real than real itself does not necessarily make it so. Okay, so so let me okay, so let me let me ask you this. So um, obviously, when we dream, as you pointed out, we can encounter entities of our imagination. Those are other dream characters. Right. I, I had a client once who who was a lucid dreamer and a very good one. Right. And she could actually ask her dream characters what they represented symbolically, and right. they would tell her. Right. And so, okay, so let me let me modify the question that I posed to you before and tell me what you think of this. So we know that the psychedelics produce an increment in trait openness. And we know with the psych with the psilocybin in particular, that if people have a mystical experience with psilocybin once or a couple of times, that their level of trait openness, which is the creativity dimension, increases by one, one standard deviation, and that appears more or less permanent. So we could say that, that one of the things the psychedelics do by loosening the strictures on the more, on the more fundamental realms of conception is place people into a state that's analogous to the state of creativity. And so if you're creative, you can shift conceptions. And the, the downside of that is you shift them when it's not necessary. And the upside is now and then you shift them in a direction that's extremely productive. And so that shifting becomes more possible under the influence of psychedelics. And then we could say that, well, it's possible that one of the uh, sources of creativity might be the capacity of the human imagination to generate fictional personalities. We do that in dreams. Obviously, your brain is, we, we would say, your brain is producing these fictional characters that have many of the attributes of real characters. When you dream, you can see them, you can hear them, you can interact with them. You don't have immediate access to their Contents, contents of consciousness. They seem like autonomous beings. And so we could say, maybe what happens when you're experimenting with psychedelics is that you enter a dreamscape that's populated by creatures of the imagination that have a certain degree of autonomy. And the influx of information that's also characteristic of the psychedelic experience produces that sense of hyper-reality that's then attributed to the characters themselves. Does that seem plausible? My, my sort of default position is anything that you experience is real. It's real because it can be experienced, but is it originate within? Is it come from the collective unconscious? Does it come from out there in some other dimension? And do these terms even make sense. I mean, you just get into a, an epistemological mess because how can you even posit there, there is an outside? I mean, one, th one thing that psychedelics do is they teach you it's all one. You know, there's no separation between the self and, and the cosmos at large and all that. So, so it's like it's a, a non-starter. It's a zero-sum game to, uh, you know, to... Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's more useful to say uh, th rather than to say are they real, you know, because they're real enough that they're experienced. So in that sense, they're real, whether they're inside or outside, originate from the self or some other dimension. Maybe the question we should ask is: Is the information that they transmit useful? Can we learn from it? Can they teach us something that we could not otherwise know? You know, and, and that seems to me potentially a more useful question. You know, and my, my brother. Amazing thing about the mushrooms, the unique thing about them is that they speak. They speak English. They talk to you. They will answer questions. They will carry on conversations, so forth and so on. No other thing in my experience speaks not like that. I mean, there may be in some at the height of some crazed trip, some brief, something or other. But psilocybin just pulls up a chair on the porch and puts its feet up, you know. And uh, and ayahuasca does not do that at least in my experience. The language of ayahuasca is visual. It, it's 
you, your the front of your head becomes like a cinemascopic camera. After a good five-hour ayahuasca trip, you just feel like your eyes must be bugging out of your head. I mean, it's like going to Madison Avenue with money. You have done so much looking. Just look, 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 and look at this, look at this. I mean, your eyes hurt from so much looking because it speaks to you in this visual language and it barely ever makes a sound and certainly no no linguistic sound. So why these things have this different presentation? And then, of course, the thing about DMT that I should have mentioned that is the most astonishing, appalling, and the, the definitive characteristic is that for a lot of people, myself included, you burst into a place that is absolutely swarming with some kind of intelligent life. I mean, I call them self-transforming elf machines. It's definitely an elf place. And, you know, you thought you were going to get the white light or you thought you were going to get an Huxley-esque aphorism on the gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. Well, it's that place. It's those gnomes. And you burst into this space, and, um, and they're saying, how wonderful that you're here. You come so rarely. We're so delighted to see you. And the, one of the things about the MT that's really puzzling is, in a sense, it doesn't affect your mind. In other words you don't change. For instance, if you take ketamine, the first thing you notice, the very first thing you notice before the trip hits is you notice that you no longer are anxious about having taken ketamine. You just sort of, anxiety leaves you. That means it's affecting your mind. It's doing something to the judgmental machinery. DMT doesn't lay a hand on the judgmental machinery. You, you break through into that space exactly who you were before breaking through. And the usual reaction of most people is something like, ah. you know, and you think, God, heartbeat, normal, pulse, normal, everything's normal, yeah, everything's normal, oh, God. Because these things are there, and they're hammering at you and they come forward they're like jewel self-dribbling basketballs and there are, there are many of them and they come pounding toward you and they will stop in front of you and vibrate but then they do a very disconcerting thing which is they jump into your body they jump into your body and then they jump back out again and the whole thing is going on in this very high speed mode where you're being presented with thousands of details per second and you can't get a hold on you say you know my god what's happening and these things are saying don't abandon yourself to amazement which is exactly what you want to do you just want to go nuts with how crazy this is they say don't do that don't do that. Pay attention. Pay attention to what we're doing. Well, what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is they're making objects with their voices. They're singing structures into existence. These things are, and what they will do is they'll come toward you and then, and you have to understand, they don't have arms, so we're kind of downloading this into a lower dimension to even describe it. But what they do is they offer things to you. Say, look at this, look at this. And as your attention goes toward these objects, you realize that what you're being shown is impossible. It's impossible it's not simply intricate, beautiful, and hard to manufacture. It's impossible to make these things. The nearest analogy would be to the Fabergé eggs or something like that. But these things are like the toys that are scattered around the nursery inside a UFO or something. <laughs> Celestial toys. And they are the toys themselves 
appear to be somehow alive, the toys themselves can uh, sing other objects into existence. So what's happening is there's just this proliferation of elf gifts. And the elf gifts are moving around, singing, and the whole thing is directed toward, they're saying, do what we are doing. And they're very insistent. They say, do it, do it, do it. And you feel like a bubble. Or, and now this is subjective. I mean, only a, you know 5% report this, but it happens to me. You feel like some kind of bubble inside your body that's beginning to move up toward your mouth. And when it comes out, it isn't sound, it's vision. You begin, to, you, you discover that you can pump stuff out of your mouth by singing. And they're urging you to do this. They say, that's it, that's it, keep doing it. And the whole thing is like, you know, we're now at minute 4.5 with this stuff. And... Uh, you speak in a kind of glossolalia. There's a spontaneous outpouring of syntax unaccompanied by what is normally called meaning. It's sort of, uh, you know, he ding wow wak sap divi muldek tipi ting get wahak si kipipi nem wahavedek dumbo haga gate.